going to be a challenging series. It has been challenging. You know why? Your flesh hates to be challenged. A lot of us, you know, we think, you know, um, you know, and some of us, there's, there's many types of personalities in this room. Uh, there's people that are, are kind of mild-mannered or maybe more quiet, and there's people that are, are loud, and, and there's people that are, um, you know, maybe when you get mad. Do we have anybody in here that when they get mad, they're an eruptor? Anybody? Okay, good. Me, two, two of us. My wife's laughing. She won't raise her hand, but she's an eruptor. <coughs> and... and <coughs> Excuse me, well, they got me on that one. <laughs> but I'm an eruptor too, though. And so when we talk, we're not really yelling. We're just erupting one a little bit louder than the other. Uh, and, and what it is is really there's another type of a person that when you might get angry, you're a stuffer. You know, and, and here's what a stuffer is. A stuffer is someone that, you know, they get angry and they just don't do anything. They don't say anything. Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. Everything's fine. Do we have, do we have any stuffers in here? That are honest, uh, a couple, yeah, yeah. I'll just do it. Everything's fine, but on the inside, you're thinking, I can't believe they did that to me. Oh my gosh, how can I kill them? Let me think of the ways. <laughs> not, 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 not real. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But you stuff things and you don't deal with them. You keep stuffing, and and both of those are really they're not healthy, uh, but they're ways that we deal with things. And uh, really, w- the reason that I believe the Lord put this on my heart about the code is because God wants to free us from erupting and stuffing and get us to where we're living a life of the kingdom of God here on earth. Because Jesus, what he said, he said, when he, you know, when the disciples asked him, hey, what, how do we pray like you prayed? And he goes, oh, that's easy. He goes, here's what you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's literally saying, hey, I want for these people, for our people, to have the conditions of heaven here on the earth. But the religion does not want that. Religion wants control. Religion wants you to uh, do things according to your works, and, and if you do good enough, then you get here. And you get, and no, but see, God wants you to have relationship. Everybody say relationship. And, and, and so this, this messages that we've been going, they're going to be challenging, and it has been challenging, but let me tell you something. It's promotion time. Everybody say it's promotion time. Do you know what promotion time? Who in here likes to be promoted? You know, usually with promotion becomes more responsibility, but also more money. You increase it, and, and, and you actually have, you know, probably a little bit more joy, maybe even a little more vacation time, a little more time to do things. So, you know, everything that happens in the kingdom of God is literally a promotion. It says that we go from faith to faith. And from glory to glory, what does that sound like? Promotion. And so whenever we hear the word, it might step on our toes, and that's okay because you know what it's doing? It's promoting. Nobody in here likes to go and, uh, you know, diet or fast or or go work out in your most uh, um, least favorite workout possible, but we do it. Why? Because we know it's promoting us. Exercise might not be the funnest thing, but what it does do is it produces strength, it produces longevity, it produces a resilience to uh, disease and strengthens your immune system. It does all these things, but when you're in the middle of doing it, some of you may not like doing it. Some of you, like myself, and some other people are a little, maybe we're a little sickos, but <laughs> we like the pain. And here's why I like the pain. I know it's producing something that's going to be lasting. And so that's why Jesus, I believe, says uh, in the Word, or God literally says in the Word, he goes, hey, um, whenever you're going through this thing, it's lightweight. It's temporary. It, it's, it's short-lived. It has an expiration date. But what that challenge and what that suffering and what that, you know, yucky feeling may be in this time is preparing, producing, and achieving something for you and in you. Amen? And so we're going to look at some things because here, here's the thing that um, I think we all should know. It says this in Proverbs, but it talks about one who gets wisdom, gets understanding. And so knowledge is the key to change. When you have knowledge of something, then you can now grow and you can learn and you can change. 
and listening is the key of learning. Now, I'm going to tell them myself. I don't want to tell anybody in here. I don't want to see a, a show of hands. But a lot of times when I'm in a debate or in a um, heated conversation with someone that I am dear to that happens to have blonde curly hair, I may be listening, but I'm really thinking about what my response is going to be. Now, don't look at your spouse or anybody, but you know you've done the same thing. And so I'm really not listening. I'm really trying to think of what I can do to come back so I can be right. And, and if we were honest with ourselves, we all do that. Or maybe sometimes, um, you know, I would talk too much and I wouldn't even hear what she's saying because I wanted to say what I wanted to say. So I really wasn't listening. And then I found out that when I did listen, that I was usually the wrong one and that she was trying to do this, 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 and then, and so I usually said, well, if you didn't say this, I wouldn't have said that. It's real quiet in this church this morning. We're all that way, and why, why are we that way? Because, see, we're so used to self. We like to think that we were born uh, sweet little precious babies, and that we were just, oh, they're so sweet, and they are, they're sweet, they're wonderful, and, and you know, some people may even say, oh, my child, when it was born, it didn't even cry. Well, okay, that's good, but it eventually did. You, all babies cry. There's not one child that's come out and said, Oh, mother, thank you for birthing me. I think that I would like some milk now. Could you please give me some milk? No. They start off, crying because they can't communicate, and all that is concerning them is them. We're all that way. We just now have maybe more hair on our head, hopefully, or maybe we're a little bit taller and not wearing diapers anymore. Some of us may still wear diapers. That's okay, too. But the thing is, is that we're, we're, we're babies that are thinking we're truly adults, and we're not. And so the Lord started to show me some things about how we can grow. We're all called to make a difference, every single one of us. Every single one of you is called to make a difference but the enemy has lied to you through different challenges or through different things that have been working at you or different things that maybe you have uh, failed at or didn't come up to where you thought it should be or something of that nature. And, and so you've lived a or settled into a lackluster type of a life. Now, it might be good. You know, hey, you might have your house that you've maybe always wanted or house that you enjoy or or things are going good doesn't mean anything's bad but you've learned to just settle in to good enough we all do that oh well I'm doing good enough like I've lost enough weight I've lost two pounds oh I'm doing good enough now I need to reward myself with some cinnamon rolls that's what we do our flesh loves to be the boss and so there's really a war going on right now Right now, there's a war going on right now in your mind. And it's a war for supremacy. Your spirit is pure. If you're born again, you have a, a spirit that is now born again. You're in connection with God. But your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotion, it's at war with your spirit and with your body. So there's a three-way battle going on right now on who is going to have supremacy. That's why it's so important for us to get this code and have things in their proper order the way God intended because God, as if you haven't learned already, God's way smarter than we are. And God also has a much better plan than we could for our own lives. You think of all the things that God's done in your life up to this point and you're like amazed at all the marvelous, miraculous things that have happened, how You've gotten into places you shouldn't have gotten in, been able to do things you shouldn't have been able to done. Your marriage is still there together and it wasn't ever supposed to be and all these things. And that's not even the tip of the iceberg of what God has for you. And so how do we get into this place of living in the blessing, living in the kingdom of God here on earth? Well, I'm glad you, you asked. So <laughs> I noticed something over the past, really the past year, year and a half, it's been kind of crazy and and there's something that's missing in our culture today there's something 
that's lacking and and you know it it's uh, this hunger this cry from the the left and and from the right and from the conservative and from the liberals and from from everybody all around they're all crying something but if you boil it down it's really the same thing everybody is crying out for r-e-s-p-e-c-t find out what it means to me they're crying out for honor they're crying out for hey what about me right I heard uh, just the other day, my wife and I were talking, and um, there's an actress by the name of Candace Cameron Bure. She left the Hallmark Channel, which, ooh, Hallmark is so racy. Not at all. Uh, but Hallmark is doing things now differently that uh, do not align with the Christian values. And so she left that network to go to this other network, and immediately this community of the LBGTQRXYZ started bashing her saying that's not fair you're not being nice you're not being right you're not honoring us she's like i'm not doing anything against you whatsoever i'm just saying i'm going over to this network because these are the values that i believe are are godly virtuous values that i want to stand by and so what we do is we try to like fold and, and meet everybody's needs and let me tell you something you'll never meet everyone's needs that is impossible. You will wear yourself out. And what's missing in our culture today is honor. In fact, um, <laughs> in a lot of churches, there's no such thing as honor. Definitely outside of churches. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like a fossil. Like, you remember the time? Does anybody remember the time or heard of the times when there was just miracles like all the time just miracles happening have you read about that his church history there's been miracle after miracle and you know you hear about William Branham and he would just start speaking and people would get he'd call things out in these tents and these tents would hold 10,000 people or you think about uh, Oral Roberts here in this you know city of faith and he would lay hands on every single person to the extent that he had to get shoulder replacement surgery that's how many hands he was laying on people and they were getting healed left and right And, and and you think back of those times in those days and you're like why isn't it happening now well it made me think about this old language that i was raised catholic and um my mom was catholic my grandmother uh, nona she was catholic and back in the mass they would read the mass or the last would be, the mass would be spoken in latin and did you know that latin is a what they consider a dead language now it's a dead language because there is not one single culture on the planet that uses Latin as a first language. And so because of that, now Latin is a dead language. I don't believe that any church in America or in the world will ever allow honor to be a dead language. See, the enemy knows the power of honor. He knows the power. And see, here's what Todd Lemons When people start hearing the word honor, they automatically put their guard up. They put their wall up. Oh, you want me to submit to you? Oh, you you want this? No, I'm not even talking about that at all. Here's what honor truly is. We don't even understand the true definition of honor. We can look at it at surface value, and, and it seems pretty cool, but let me tell you something. Honor is access to the kingdom of God. It's the key to the kingdom of God in your life. Now, they say in in the Bible that, you know, God is love. Has anyone heard that before? It says that very clearly. It says God is love. Now, if you say, here's me, I'm Paul, Paul Cooper. Well, God's saying, hey, I'm love. Now, you know what's in the inner workings of love? Honor. Because you can't love without honoring, and you can't honor without loving. They're two and of the same. And so we're going to look at some things today. We want to look at what honor truly is. Do you want to know what honor really is? You want to know what it really means? So let me, let me tell you where it comes from. It literally comes from the Hebrew word or a Hebrew marketplace. The word honor, it comes from the Hebrew marketplace. And I literally, I started looking up the word and I go, wait, that Hebrew word is very, very similar in my mind. It reminds me of something. And then I looked it up. And did you know that the word honor in Hebrew is kavod? And did you know what else another word for kavod is in our English language? 
glory. So honor and glory, according to God's language, are synonymous. So think of it this way. It gives you a whole different understanding now. When Moses was out and he was in the cleft of the rock and he said, show me your glory or show your, your kavod, he was literally saying, show me your honor. And here's what it meant by in the marketplace. What they would do is they would have these scales, and they would take the product or whatever it may be, and they would set it on the scale, and then based on the weightiness of it, it would increase in value. And that's where the word kavod or glory or honor came from because the heavier or the weightier it was, the more value it had. Are you hearing me this morning? See, the value that you place on your spouse, your boss, your kids, your peers will determine the weightiness that they have in your life. Are you with me? So check this out. This word, honor, here's the English part of it. It means this. High respect. Esteem, privilege, regard with great respect. Now, here's where I really want to get to. Honor is of the heart. Amen? Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now, see, God's talking to the nation here, and, and, and listen to this. He's literally going, <coughs> he's asking them something. He goes, hey, therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said, indeed, that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, says the Lord, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, we've heard that time and time again, but God's literally asking them a question. He's saying, hey, where, where is my honor? He goes, you, you honor me, I will honor you back. But if you lightly esteem me, you're going to receive a light esteem as well. And so the things that, you know, you value as important, God will value as important as if you put him first. But if you don't, they're not going to. He's not going to. And so really honor, it, it lacks this, this true meaning of honor is literally this, is seeking and placing value on something that is precious. That's what honor truly is. Seeking or placing value on something that is precious. A lot of times when we get a new car, we honor our new car and we park at the very back of Walmart, right? Oh, I, that's good. I need to get my steps in today. And you, you go walking off and then, and then closer as it gets, you get your first nick or your first little scratch and suddenly you're parking midway into Walmart. And the next thing you know, uh, six months to a year later, like, oh, glory to God, I got a spot right in the front. woo -hoo. What happened? You're not valuing that as precious as much anymore. Why is that? It's of the heart. See, when something's new and, 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 and precious and valuable to us, we, we place high esteem, we place high regard on it. And God's saying, hey, if you will place me as precious and high regard, I will do the very same for you. And God is an if-then God. If you do this, then he will do that. And you're saying, well, Paul, um, this is Old Testament. We're under this new and better covenant. We don't even have to tithe anymore because that's Old Testament. No, that's not true at all. That that scripture that you're, you're going to you know, reference and you know, I've got about five or six for you that, you know, can refute that. You know, how about this one? God says, I do not change. Here's one. Uh, number two is, you know, Galatians. Look at this one. Galatians. This is talking about honor. Don't be deceived and deluded and misled. That's what the enemy loves to do. There it is right there. Deceived, deluded, and misled. The enemy wants you deceived. He wants you deluded, and he wants you misled concerning the things of heaven. It doesn't matter about tithing. He doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. He could care less about your money. That's, that's nothing. He's the one that showed Adam that it was good. He didn't even know. 
he like showed Adam where the jewels and all these things were, and Adam was like, oh, okay. And he says, oh, this is good. Oh, good, good. Literally. That, I mean, we, you need to look at the Bible that way. We, we like to look at the Bible and we think that, oh, yes, everything was holy and everything was perfect and, and just, no. It says that God had to show Adam where it was, and then he showed him that it was good. Because think about this. As a child, um, we, we had people over, for we had family over, um, for Thanksgiving, and um, my nephew's son was there. He's two-ish, and he's ah, oh, hey, ah, oh, green. You know, like he's he's doing all these things, and you know, he doesn't know if something is two thousand dollars or two cents. He doesn't know. He doesn't care. Like ah, ah, green. Like this could be like some special. You know, crystal that costs five thousand dollars. <laughs> no. Oh, got your attention. See? What happened? What happened? Suddenly I didn't honor this seventy-eight cent piece of water. But the same thing happens to us as adults as it does when you're a child. God has to show you where to place honor and where not. He's saying, don't look at the things. Don't look at all these accolades. Don't look at this place of promotion or status. You need to look to me. And if you look to me with your heart, then you'll see the true value that he has for you. Did you know it takes faith to honor? Has anybody had a boss that they have had challenges with? Yeah, yeah. We all have. It takes faith to honor your boss that you feel like he or she has it out for you. Yeah? It takes faith to do that. Because what you're saying is like, I don't really see it, and I sure don't feel it right now, but I'm choosing to honor you because God says what I honor, he honors. Amen? So the issue that I believe that we have as you know, churches is we've allowed the enemy to kind of slip in and slide in on us to the place like this where we start treating n nobody in this room because you're here, okay? <laughs> uh, but we treat church like we treat going to the movies. Hey, what time is your? Oh, you only have one. Oh, oh, do you, I need I need options. That doesn't work out for me. And, and so we, we, we treat it like, oh, well, you know, probably going to have to spend, you know, $27 on popcorn and Coca-Cola. And we're going out there. And they were like, oh, that wasn't very entertaining. I don't I really like that one. I'm going to give that one like three stars. Getting real quiet in here. But see, many people treat church like that, like entertain me. But if you would truly honor the place that God set you in and called you to, you'll start seeing things unfold in your life that you never could before. A lot of the reason why many are sick and frustrated and, and, and upset is because they have dishonored the things that God's told them to honor. It's true. Amen? Galatians says this. Pack it back up there, please. It says that whatever, don't be misled, deluded, and deceived, God will not allow himself to be sneered at, scorned, disdained, or mocked by mere pretensions of professions or by precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes himself who attempts to delude God. Next verse. For whatever a man sows, that only is what he will reap. So if you sow honor, guess what you're going to reap? What? Honor. And so if you sow discord or dishonor, guess what you're going to reap? Dishonor. Click. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. So you pay the honor that you owe. You owe honor to people already. Here's what we believe here. Uh, in, in fact, it was on your offering envelope. It says honor because nothing else matters. Nothing else matters except honor. Here's one of the things that Jesus says about it. I think that we should follow what he says because he's probably the most important person in our life should be Matthew 15 says this 
This is in the uh, Amplified. And it says here, so for the sake of your tradition, the rules that have been handed to you by your forefathers, you've set aside the word of God and you've deprived it of force and authority, making it of no effect in your life. Stop for a second and think about that. Jesus says, hey, you've taken this word of God and you've robbed it of having any authority, any power, any miracle working uh, possibility in your life. Why? Because of your traditions. Because of what you've chosen to honor or value. He says, uh, you've deprived it of forces already making it of no effect. Click. You pretenders, you hypocrites, you admirably and truly did as Isaiah prophesied when he said this. The people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts hold off and are far away from me. This is Jesus talking. So here's what he was saying. I want you to get the context of the scripture that he was speaking of. He was saying this because at the time there were people and they were um, using their offering, you know, above their tithe as a korban. And the word korban means a gift dedicated unto God. And really what they were supposed to be doing is supporting their uh, mothers and fathers. And so what he was saying is, hey, you're treating what I've called as holy and honorable and you've robbed it. You've robbed me of having power in your life because you are making excuses. You're honoring me with yours. Yes, oh, this is the korban. But really, they were taking that money and spending it on themselves and using it for their own selfish good. <clears throat> so whenever you see a lack of support or lack of power, you're seeing truly a lack of honor. Amen? But here's the cool thing about God, though. This isn't a negative message whatsoever. This is a, actually a very positive message. See, God will never put something on you that you don't want. Think about that for a second. Now, let me be very clear. The Holy Spirit will give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to yield to the promptings of the Father. But He won't force it on you. Like, hey, you need, to, you need to make that right, or hey, you need to work on that, or hey, maybe you need to start doing this. Hey, spend some time with me. And he will, he will give you an opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, but he won't force it on you, okay? So the thing is, is you need to hunger after it. Jesus says those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it will be, what? Added unto them. See, if you'll seek after God's way of doing things over our way of doing things, that's honoring the Word of God over how we feel, then we'll start seeing those miracles in our lives again. You'll start seeing breakthrough in your life that you never knew could happen before. Amen? But the thing is, is we have to honor small just as much as we honor big. It'd be real easy for us if we had like a guest speaker coming here that everyone knew. Oh, man, I can't wait. You'd be here early and everything piled up. But what if someone, you know, hey, there's some guy on the street who can come up here and he's going to minister. Or, or Pastor Dan is up here or, or I'm up here. Like, yeah, well, you know, I'm kind of busy or whatever. You know, not, not so sure. No, see, we need to honor every area, no matter how large or how small or who it may be or who we may think it isn't. That brings me back to thinking about Naaman. You guys know the story of Naaman? Now, Naaman's found in Kings, and Naaman was a mighty warrior. He was valiant. He was like the guy that everyone wanted to be. He would, if they had player cards, he would have a player card. If they had, like, little figurine superhero guys, he would be that. Naaman was the man. And Naaman uh, got leprosy. And now, here's what the interesting thing about leprosy was, is leprosy... It kills all of your nerve endings to where you don't feel. And what happens is sometimes you, you might cut yourself or bump something or break something, and you can't feel it, and then infection sets in, and it starts to eat away at your flesh. It's a very gross, very nasty thing. But uh, Naaman had leprosy, and he went and tried everything he could, and he's like, I don't know what to do. Here's the thing about leprosy, what it does is leprosy separates you. It isolates you. And, and, and 
during this, you know, passage, we see that Naaman was, you know, distraught, but his wife had a servant that Naaman had brought in from one of his conquests, and this servant girl was from Israel, and she said, there's a prophet of our land that if you'll go to him, he'll heal you. And what did he do? If you were to read it, spend some time reading it for yourself. He even said, oh, okay. And what did he do? He went to the king of that land first. So he's like, oh, I don't know. I'm not going to honor what this little servant girl's telling me to do. I'm going to go to the king. And you know what the king of Israel said? He goes, what have I done to you? Am I God? He goes, are you kidding me? I can't heal you. And he goes, go to, go to the prophet Elijah. And so sure enough, he goes to the prophet Elijah. He comes up there in his little chariot, his six-horsepower car, because there was probably six horses that were pulling him there. Okay? You got to picture it in your head like a movie. And, and so he pulls up, and, and you can see Elijah's servant. He's like, oh, Naaman's, Naaman's out front. Oh, my God, Naaman's out front. And he's like, yeah, so? He goes, you know, Naaman, the, the, the warrior, the, the leprous guy, the king has sent him out front. He goes, well, go. Go out there and talk to him. And he goes, what? Uh, I don't, what he? he goes, calm down. Calm down. This is my paraphrase, okay? He's like, calm down. He goes, but I, uh, do you think he'll take a selfie with me? Because like he's, he's like the man. Like he had a blue check mark on his name. Okay? Like I got to get a selfie with this guy. I mean, nobody's going to believe this. He goes, okay, leave your phone here. <laughs> he says, go out there and tell him that I said to go dip in the Jordan seven times. And so he comes back and, and you know, he goes, uh, um, uh, yeah, Naaman, um, thank you so much for coming. We're so honored that you're here. It's amazing. Um, but uh, Elijah said that if you go on and go on the river and dip seven times in Jordan, you'll be healed. And he's like, what? Like Naaman's fired up. And he's like, are you kidding me? I came all the way out here to this place to come to you, and you're telling me to go dip in the Mississippi River? Or around here, the Arkansas River? Man, are there not this river, that river, that are 10 times cleaner back in my own hometown? What was happening? His heart was haughty against doing the little thing and honoring the little thing that the man of God, the prophet of God was telling him to do. Sometimes we miss our miracle because we won't do the little things that God's asking us to do. Hey, maybe you need to pray for your boss that gets on your last main nerve. Hey, maybe you should start to you know, spend more time doing this. Whatever it is that God's talking to you and asking you to do, in those little things, if you'll honor it, you'll see the miracle. And so finally, he, he drives off angry. It says that he just went off, left, angry, super upset. And the servant said, hey, if he told you to maybe, and I'm just me paraphrasing, if he told you to wrestle an alligator, would you have done it? He goes, absolutely. If he told you to bring a bazillion dollars, would you? Well, I already brought a ton. Of course I would. Well, if he told you to go dip in your own rivers, would you? Yeah. And he goes, well, what, what is it going to hurt to do this one little thing? Why don't you just honor the word that's been given? And here's what I love is he finally humbled himself. He says, okay, I'm going to honor the word that's given. I'm going to swallow my pride. Did you know the first sin was not Adam and Eve in the garden? The first sin was Lucifer or Satan not honoring the Lord. He's like, I should be getting all the credit for this. I'm doing all the work. I'm the one made of instruments. See, the, the, the root of pride is dishonor. It's fear. Afraid that someone's going to get ahead, that you're not getting your, your just due. Now, so what, is a, what does Naaman do? I love this. I love this because 
we love, who in here loves suddenlies? I do, two, four of us, seven of us. Okay, good. We all love suddenlies. I love reading the Bible about suddenlies. I love Chick-fil-A because suddenly I get my meal in a very short amount of time. And now we have all these apps all the time. We can order ahead of time, and then we get upset. I drove here and ordered it, and it's not ready. You know, like we get super upset because it's not ready when we think it should be ready. We've become conditioned or, or wooed into this culture of I want it now, this instantaneous culture. Now, my wife and I, we don't use our microwave. We don't like microwaves. But microwaves are pretty in interesting. They're pretty neat because you can just heat something up in a matter of one minute, and boom, it's hot. Something that would take, you know, five to ten minutes to boil water, you can get it in one minute. Now, it kills everything that's in there. <laughs> it's a radio wave. It's a bad deal. But, you know, we, we love instant. We love quickly. And, and I think that Naaman, this is me. Uh, if I'm Naaman, I'm going to go, okay, fine. I'm going to dip in this nasty butt river can't believe I'm doing this now we think that we end up there with the you because I guarantee you when he went there now if you were called to let's just say that your um, for let's say the former president of the United States was in office and you got an invitation to go visit him or let's say you got an invitation to go visit uh, Mar-a-Lago if that's like your thing to do if you think that would be amazing or whatever your you know thing is would you show up in flip-flops cut off shorts and a t-shirt no Hopefully not. Why? Because you want to honor the person that has invited you. And so I guarantee you, he comes, you know, rolling up in there, and he's got his all shiny armor on, he's got his headdress on, and he's got all of this, you know, wooey, flowy stuff. So he doesn't go jump in the river with all that on. He has to strip it off. He has to peel off all the layers. That's what honor does. Honor removes the layers and gets down to the heart of the matter. And as he dipped in that river, and this is, if this is me, you know, I dip down in one time and I come up, okay. Uh, it's still there. What, where's the miracle? Two times. What? It's, this isn't working. I'll keep going. Three times. Four times. And so, so finally by the, 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 what is it, the seventh time, he comes up and it says that he was clean restored and his skin was not only restored it was better than when he first had it it said that it was like when he was a baby isn't that like god because if you if you see god he's not only going to restore it like thank god he didn't restore him to his 30 or 40 year old skin and that's when all the ladies you know yeah amen he didn't have to exfoliate anymore he doesn't have to do any of this late night stuff it's just fresh. It's new. But he had to honor the word that was given. See, the Lord does not like it when we dishonor. And I think that's why we don't have power in the church you nowadays. As a matter of fact, if you look into the Old Testament, um, Moses, he married someone that they didn't approve of. His brother uh, and sister, Aaron and Miriam, they didn't approve of it. And because you know she wasn't of the same race or the same clan as what they thought was appropriate, she started to complain and murmur against him. And it says very clearly uh, in Numbers 12, you can read it for yourself. It says, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? This is them complaining. Like, is he the only one that's going to get talked to? And has he not spoken through us? And the Lord heard what they were saying. So you have to watch what you're saying. Because the Lord hears all of us. All of us. That's why I've been repenting all week. I'm just kidding kidding but it's so true you know we need to you know watch our heart our heart condition is what truly matters because really when you start complaining and murmuring that's truly a spirit of dishonor I mean look at what happened to Miriam it says she got put outside the camp she got leprosy and she got put outside the camp and that's you know here's one thing like I said about leprosy leprosy separates you it isolates you, and then you no longer feel things. And here's how you know if you've allowed some dishonor into your heart. It's like you come in here, and the praise and worship is going off like crazy, but you don't feel anything. The word's being preached, but you're not getting stirred up. The anointing's present, people are getting healed, but yet you're not sensing anything. That's when you have a spirit of dishonor. And it's not like, oh, well, you know, no, yeah. 
I, I just, you don't understand. Maybe I don't, but I do know this. Every time in my life that I haven't sensed the Holy Spirit when it was obvious and in the house was because I had an area in my life that I had dishonor or allowed dishonor in. And so if you're, you know, as anybody besides me, I'm always of this mindset and I'm always checking my heart. I'm always like, God, I want more of you. Does anybody besides me want more of God? I think if we were all honest, we would all raise our hands right now. And, and so I'm always like, God, I just want more of you. And I thank you that, that you know, the more that I draw near to you, you draw near to me. The more that I sow uh, into you, you're sowing back into me. The more that I seek you, the more I find you. But it's interesting when I'll start to do something and then I'll feel like, ugh, like a thought will come in. Does anybody ever have a thought come in when you're praising and worshiping the Lord and then it's like something negative? Maybe that happened to you or maybe that someone you uh, once trusted in or looked up to hurt your feelings or maybe your spouse said something. Ooh, that was, sorry, Lord. <laughs> but that's usually what happens when you're trying to draw into God. The enemy will come in and remind you of things that will try to separate your heart from honoring him because here's the thing. If you can't honor your spouse or honor the ones around you, you can't honor God. Didn't Jesus say uh, that, that any of these things that you've done to the children, to the widows, to the heirs, you've, to the least of these is what he truly said, you've done unto me. Jesus said that. And so if we will truly honor the ones around us, the ones closest to us, we would have a supernatural life. Come on, somebody. See, here's what honor truly is. is when you know someone and you know all the ins and outs of them, you know their highs and lows, their strengths and their weaknesses, and you choose to honor them anyway. That's what true honor is. Placing high value on them. Amen? <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about, you know, this spirit of dishonor and stuff, and uh, you know, Noah, we know the story of Noah, the boat, remember? The two going in. There was actually more than two. Those were just the other animals, but there were, there were more. And so Noah, and we, the reason why I want to bring this up is because we just had Thanksgiving with our families, right? And we had a good one. We had a good one, you know. Um, but I went to Nordagio's yesterday to pick up some coffee, and the person that was, you know, working there was like, hey, how was your Thanksgiving? And they're like, oh, it's fine. Uh, we went over to, you know, uh, family's house and there was no fights until right about the end and we felt like the fight was about to start to break off and that's when we left <laughs> I was like okay and you were there for how long oh three hours oh wow okay so Noah he's with his family and all these animals that are stinky and loud and busy for 40 days and 40 nights and as soon as he got off that boat he went and got drunk and you probably would too if you no I'm just kidding but <laughs> not saying you would, but you know, hey, you have 40 days, 40 nights, whatever, it's crazy. I'm not going to drink, you know, but anyhow. So he gets drunk, and, and, and he gets, he's, he's just, he's drunk, he's bad, he's drunk. And Ham, one of his sons, he's like, ha, 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 oh, he saw him, and he went to his brothers, he goes, ha, 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 and he started disgracing his father. He said, ah, he's drunk, I saw him, it's crazy, he's naked, and he started to shame him. And his brother said, whoa, whoa, what, what? And so they wouldn't even look upon him. They walked in backwards to cover him and clothe him because they wanted to honor their father. And as it goes on, it says that, that Noah ended up blessing all of these children. Then when he got to Ham, he didn't bless Ham. He literally said, cursed be your son Cain from this moment forward. You know, he's, and, and so the thing is, is what I want you to realize about this, this honoring and dishonoring is this. We all have flesh. We can't be holier than now and, and try to hold a standard higher to someone else that we don't even hold for ourselves. Because a lot of times what we do is we, like I said, we're eruptors or stuffers. If something happens, you're like, well, I wouldn't have said that if you didn't say this. It's real quiet in this house. But that's what we've done. I mean, my wife and I, we've done that. I've done that with my kids. I've done that with other people too. Why is that? Because we're not really honoring in the way that we should be. 
Now, Jesus says that if you honor a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward, right? And so it's really like, hey, if you treat them in the place of honor or regard, that's what you'll get. But then if you don't, then that's what you're going to get. So if you get a, a yo bro or a hey man, that's the kind of reward you're going to get. But if you honor someone in the place of, the, of God that is placed in their life for you, then that's the kind of reward you're going to get. Amen? <clears throat> see, the only way we could truly, you know, see the miraculous and walk in those things, because this is really what's been on my heart. I want to see more of the miraculous in my life and in this house. I know that God's called this place to be a place of miracle signs and wonders. So when you walk in here, that healing, and we've seen healing, one healing after another. Not even just a few weeks ago, my wife was sick as a dog, and there was uh, other people here, and we, it was a Wednesday night, and we didn't even get to start. And someone's back was in some pain, and we prayed, and boom, they got healed right then and there. And then my wife got healed. And then there was just like healing all through that on a Wednesday night. So don't miss Wednesdays, guys. <laughs> but, but really, it all boils down to honor. They came hungry. They came expecting. So when you honor something, you place value upon it. And it's really not something that only happens on Sundays. It's a lifestyle. We live a lifestyle of honor, not when it's convenient for us. It's never convenient for you, really. You know, I think about Elijah. Remember Elijah, and he called down fire from heaven, and it licked up the thing, and then he says, hey, I'm going to go pray. And he tipped the king off. He goes, I smell the sound. I hear the sound. I'm sorry. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And he sent the king off. And so then while he was praying, he sent his servant out seven times. He comes back, nothing. Second time, nothing. Third time, nothing. By the sixth time, he's probably upset like, man, there's still nothing, Elijah. And finally on the seventh time, he comes back, hey, there's a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah goes, that's it? Go tell the king that it's about to rain. Have a party. How cool would it be to be that servant? I'm sure that wasn't convenient for him because they didn't have, like, motorized electric bikes. They didn't have uh, segways. <laughs> he had to get and walk all the way there. Nope, nothing yet. And come back to Elijah. Nothing yet. And then finally when it comes, then he goes, hey, go to the king. So then he had to run and race to the king. Amen? <clears throat> See, what you honor is going to release life. What you honor will release life in your life. Jesus said to the centurion, he goes, I've never seen such a great faith. Just speak the word and it'll be healed. I've never seen such a great faith. And when he saw that, what happened? He says, at that same hour, the centurion's servant was healed. See, what you honor will bring life into your life. What would our lives look like if we began to honor each other? See, if we could out-honor the other person. What would your marriage look like? You, if, you, if you have a passionless marriage... You want some passion back in your marriage? Start to honor your spouse. Not the things that you want done for you, but what they would want done. Like my wife would be like, clean the house. I was like, well, no, get behind me. Say, hey, but every time I clean the house, when she doesn't expect me to clean the house, suddenly she'd go, oh, babe, you're amazing. Thank you so much. I'm like, hey, thank you. See, you have to honor. When you honor up and honor down you honor all around and the more you honor the more the gifts will increase in your life you want to have more gifts of the spirit you want to see more gifts of the spirit start honoring God more start honoring God in your home honoring God at your workplace honor God here amen see when you dishonor your spouse well you're dishonoring God now how do we do that I'm going to show you we're going to close with this Philippians 2 says this <coughs> excuse me <coughs> it says let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit that alone right there should stop us and we should look at that a little bit closer how often do we do things through selfish ambition 
well, I'm going to do that because it's going to bring this. Or I'm going to do that, you know, because I, I deserve it. He says, don't do that. But do it in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem or honor others better than himself. This is Paul talking to the church of Philippi. And this church is known as the church of brotherly love. And he's giving them instruction on how to operate and how to walk in the power of God or honor of God. He goes, let, you, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearances of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death of the cross. See, God wants to heal, restore, promote, bless, redeem, reunite all of you more than you could possibly imagine. But the key is honor. So you got to remove that spirit of dishonor and begin to honor and then watch what God does. Amen. What would our houses look like if we honored God? What would our workplaces look like if we honored God? What would our marriages look like if we honored God? What would this church look like if we honored each other as we honor God? 